<laughs> Shannon, Shannon Adams, I cannot see you at the moment. Where are you? I'm going to try and find I'm you. I'm here. I think it's you just here. many of us now. There are a few of us. That's good. Um, Shannon, I'm terrible at introducing people. I can introduce myself. Don't worry. Um, yeah? I see you have a question from Heather, whether the meetings will be recorded once in person. Indeed. Um, in person, yes, all the upcoming meetings will be recorded. Um, they will also be hybrid. So if you have to stay at home and you live up island or whatnot, we'll make sure that those are going to be available for you to view from Zoom or, yeah, Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for noticing that. Well, Shannon, that's all Can I, I had to... Off? Yeah. Sure. Would you like me to just kick off? Because I think um, I know many of the folks here and for the folks who don't, I'm, maybe my story is most relevant through the presentation. Um, but just location wise, I'm sitting down here in Seattle, not that far away. And um, I do hope to come up and visit you guys when you're in person, particularly if mushrooms are out. Mm -hmm. I very much enjoyed a recent visit to Key Council. Um, besides the fact that we all got COVID, it was a wonderful trip to see everybody. And it just reminded me how really valuable it is for us to all be in person. So looking forward to gathering around the mushroom table. But for now, let me see if I can do the important step of sharing my screen and getting ready to um, just show you and talk through um, some of what my obsession is with Cortinarius. So let me just see if I can get slideshow going from the beginning and um, I'll tell you my story. So uh, as you probably saw from the title, hopefully this is not a shock to you that we are here today uh, to talk about Cortinarius. And uh, from this picture here, you can see a picture of me out in the field taking photographs of Cortinarius with my piece of foil wrapped over a bit of a cardboard box to reflect light on the mushroom. And on the left is a photograph of a Cortinarius. It's a demosibi, which means skin, head, derm, is skin, and cybe is head. And it's one of the many beautiful kinds of groups of Cortinarius that we're going to talk about today. But I want to be clear. Uh, we all have a problem with Cortinarius, right? Let's get the elephant in the room. And I made this picture with one of these newfangled generative AI things. I said to it, show me people looking concerned about mushrooms. And then here they do, don't they? They're looking very worried <laughs> about mushrooms. And then I said, make me an illustration of a guidebook with complicated mushrooms. And by golly, this looks like it's some kind of hybrid fern thing. Uh, but it, it feels like that sometimes. And one of the most common things I hear from people when I say I'm studying Cortinarius, they go, you poor thing, I'm sorry. Or why? Or, you know, we just don't identify Cortinarius. They're, they're too tough. So I'm here today to give you some tools so that you can start to say, you know, I do identify Cortinarius. I know what a Cortinarius is. And the way I'm approaching this is, is making it purposeful to identify. Because, you know, we all come to mushrooms from a different perspective. Some people want to eat them. Some people are just interested in identifying what we see when we're out, like many of you. I heard you talking about how I found this thing. This was out in the forest. This was near my home. And so it's like a way for us to connect and understand the things we see around us. And then there are going to be some of you, I recognize some of your names, who are really interested in taxonomy. And I'd like to challenge those folks to get a bit more interested in Cortinarius taxonomy. But there's an entry point for everyone. Cortinarius is not just an expert genus. Okay, so how are we going to learn about Cortinarius? Let's start with the basics. Uh, you know, somebody was asking, is this a feature of a Cortinarius? What is a Cortinarius? So let's start there. Uh, in, in the books, um, Cortinarius is actually, I'm calling it family Cortinariaceae. I know it's a long word, but it means the family of Cortinarius has only one genus. There is one called Stephanopus as well that's a technically in Cortinaria Asia, but it hasn't been genetically validated. So we're not really sure where it fits in the families of mushrooms. So even Cortinarius, though, has thousands and thousands of species. We don't really know how many. Um, some people estimate 5,000 in journal articles. Some people talk about 3,000 genetic sequences. That means 3,000 fingerprints of different Cortinarius. Um, and other people point to guidebooks that have, you know, 20 or 100. The first one was a mushroom called, Cortin called Agaricus violaceus, described 
back in 1753. So Cortinarius have been around a long time. They've had, uh, you know, a time for us to paint them, to eat them, to in in, in Europe, there's a, a society, a mushroom society dedicated to Cortinarius. And they have a global distribution. When I search journals, they're frequently being described from Pakistan, from China, from New Zealand, um, some still being found in Europe or given new names. So they are a global, large, diverse genus. So what are the features they have in common? One of the most notable is from the name, right? They're called Cortinarius, and Cortina means like curtain. So if you think of the gills of a, of a mushroom being like its face, the Cortina is a cobwebby curtain. Sometimes it's a thick curtain, sometimes it's delicate, sometimes it's almost invisible. But it's a, a feature of the macrofungus that covers the gills or, or joins the base of the mushroom to the gills. And Cortinarius also is um, rusty spored. So it's like a cinnamon brown to a slightly darker brown to an ochre. And it can be separated from other genera with rusty spores that you might be familiar with. You, know, you might see foliota. Um, you might see various other wood-loving fungi by being terrestrial. So it doesn't grow up on wood, except if it's very decomposing in a you know sort of a moist, mossy forest. Um, and they also often have this silky stuff. So it's not so easy to tell unless you're comparing to something else. But imagine you're comparing to a russula that has a very smoothish stipe or a hygrosopy, which has a kind of uh, rubbery almost look to the surface. Here it often has this look as though it's been spun and covered by a silkworm. Uh, it's got that kind of coating of fibers. You can see it a bit down here. You can see it more on the top right. And you can see it in this gelatinous purple. And if you're into microscopy, a final feature, the spores are often have little like warts on them, dots, so you could see that. So just to go over a few examples, here you can see that curtain. Okay, you can imagine the face of the mushrooms in there under the gill, and this is the curtain covering it. It's really fine and faint, like very cobwebby threads. And what would happen here, you can see a bit better in this example, as the mushroom was growing, the fibers covered the whole mushroom like a little cocoon. And as it grows, it stretches and pops, and you'll see little threads of the cortina left on the side of the cap and a coating left on the stipe. And that's often what the cortina or veil um, is. In some cases, though, that veil can be very skimmed. So it's a big trick and watch out. If you do see a veil, it really helps you diagnose and identify a cortinarius. But if you don't see a veil, don't exclude the cortinarius because there are some, if you read a guidebook or a description that say scant veil or very slight veil or occasional veil. And you can still see it on the stipe though. There's still a kind of coating here on the left and might be a little bit of a fibrous look on the right, but you're not seeing that kind of really hairy, um, thick curtainous veil uh, on all of them. And it gets more complex because they all look quite diverse. There's a wide range of groups within Cortinaris. So even though, remember, I've given you those criteria, the Cortina, the silky stipe, they're terrestrial, they have rusty spores, the spores can be ornamented. Uh, but you're still, you know, still not seeing those common facts. That's not just telling you, aha, uh -huh, I've definitely got a Cortinarius. Like if we look at this one here, it's slightly sequestrated, starting to turn into a truffle. Um, the one on the bottom right is bright red gills. How do you know that's a rusty spore print? Or the one in the top row looks pale. Maybe that's a tricholoma. So you can easily get caught if you look at just one of those features. One of the most useful features that you see on many is the fact that the cortina or the little veil threads often catch spores as they drop. So think of a spider web catching dew drops in the rain um, that has that little kind of pattern that forms on it. In the same way, those little cobwebby rem remnants on the stipe often catch the cortina, catch the, the brownish, the rusty spores, and it gives you a clue about the actual spore color of that mushroom, even if the gills might not look that. So for example, if you look at that one in the center of the picture here with the pink stripe on it, that's potassium hydroxide I dropped on the cap. And that is a diagnostic feature, which we'll talk about later. And if you look at the stipe, you'll see like a smudgy brown pattern. That's the, the spores dropping from those beautiful lilac gills and they're getting caught in the cobwebby veil. And so that would tell me, aha, this is a brown spored, not a white spored mushroom. 
and that would immediately take me to the right section of my guidebook and I'd have a chance of identifying. So as I show you more photographs, keep your eyes out, keep your eyes open for those telltale kind of cobwebby threads with the, the spore print, um, the spores gathering on the site. But where do we go from here? Um, as I said, I'm going to suggest three reasons to identify cotton areas and give you some tips no matter where you're starting your journey from. So the first one, if you want to know why, you know, what you can eat, that's obviously you need to know what's edible, what's and not edible. The second uh, reason you might want to just identify more of the things you, you, you bring to your mushroom ID tables um, to understand what's in your garden, to understand what you're seeing on your hikes. Or in the third case, maybe you want to get a bit more hardcore about cotton areas. I encourage you. Um, in that case, we need to think about the taxonomy, the structure of how the Cortinarius groups are organized and the relationships between them, because that helps us get to groups more easily. So we're going to start with edible. So when you think about eating mushrooms, you've got to do three things. You've got to know what is edible um, and tasty. You've got to know what is similar to those things that you can avoid. And you want to avoid things that are actually toxic. So let's look at each of those. There are only two quaternaries I'm going to talk about as edible, although elsewhere in the world, people do talk, eat certain other quaternaries. For example, quaternaries, prey stems, is eaten in Europe and sold in markets there. Here we have quaternaries violaceus. I'm not suggesting you go out and eat this regularly because it's a relatively scarce mushroom. It, it can be abundant in certain older growth areas, but I don't see it all the time. But it is edible. It has this beautiful purple color. It's very distinctive. The cap is tomentose. Um, and you really can't mistake it for anything else. Um, and so get in any trouble. Uh, Cortinarius violaceus was actually a group that Emma Harawa in your area has worked on, and she has described several species. Um, and it's also important because Cortinarius violaceus was the type, which means it was the type species. It was the first species described as significantly representing the genus Cortinarius. So even though it doesn't look like all the others, it actually represents the genus Cortinarius itself. Warning though, it's not choice. So some people say it's muddy. Um, some people find it just a bit bland. Uh, it still can be interesting if you like to keep a list of things you can eat. It's a Cortinarius that you, know, you can put on the table. Again, remember we're looking for those telltale signs here you've got the little cobwebby um, remnants on the edge, the cortina, and you've got little bits at the top of the stipe, and it's orange. It's orange brown. That rusty color shows that the mature spores have dropped. And even though the gills are purple, we can tell the spore color is not purple by seeing those remnants. And if you were doing microscopy, they're a prime location for you to catch a few spores and have a look at them under the microscope. So we're just looking at those spots. The most widely eaten Cortinarius is Cortinarius caparatus. Um, its common name is the gypsy or sometimes the wrinkled court. And it's actually quite choice. Uh, there are a lot of people eating it. I was up in Alaska recently and a lot of people collect baskets of it there where it's pretty common. Uh, but I do caution that it's not a beginner's mushroom and I'll show you why. So before we go into the warnings, um, let's identify this one together. And I, I have seen that this is pretty common in your area because when I looked at INAT, it's something that is found probably more than 50 times or 60 times on INET just in the coastal BC region. So what do we see on a caparatus? I'm curious um, in the room, just think, if you're someone who can ID um, caparatus, you, I'd love to know in the chat and I'll look at it later. I'm always interested in knowing people's levels of comfort with different courts and what they eat. But these are the three features I encourage you to look at. Firstly, the cap. The cap is wrinkled. It's not always super easy to see. But if you look at the right upper example, you'll see it has this kind of folded, almost like corrugated cardboard um, folds in the cap there. It looks kind of almost skin-like. And that can be a little less easy to see as it expands, but you still sometimes see little wrinkles. That's why it's called the wrinkled court or the, the gypsy court for the folds in the skirt. Uh, in the young specimens, you'll sometimes see this white powdery coating. And I'll have a photo they had that better, but it's on the top right. You see this slight, like almost like someone sprinkled talcum powder on it. And the most significant feature is the annulus. Annulus is a fancy term for, for basically the skirt or this um, ring um, that is around the mushroom. And you can see it here in the center. It's a distinctively unusual ring. It's not like those pictures I showed you before. 
It's a little bit more like an agaricus ring, but slightly different. So let's look at another example. You can see up close here, if this ring is um, lifted upwards like a skirt here. And I would encourage you not to eat the Cortinarius caparitus without that annulus present, because there are too many Cortinarius that kind of look sort of similar, except they lack the skirt. So final, just reassuring pattern, zigzag pattern on the upper stipe. I didn't see this mentioned in many guidebooks, but it's pretty consistent. And I was checking them in Alaska recently, and I saw it on many of the um, fruit bunnies I saw there. So this is quiz time. Imagine you're sitting here, you've come along and you're seeing this Cortinarius. Do you think this is Cortinarius caparatus? Just look at it a little bit and see what I've told you. Like, does it have a slightly powdery look on the cap? Just think about that for yourself. Um, do you see any wrinkles? Mm, like, I'm not sure I do. Maybe I do in the upright one at the, on the margin. Do I see an annulus? I'm like, huh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I see an annular ring just below the cap there, and it's still attached on the bottom one to the left. So I'm pretty confident this is Cortinarius caparatus. And it is. I looked at other photos, and I'm pretty sure this is a Cortinarius caparatus. Here's another one. Let's see. Do we have wrinkles on the cap? Yeah, look at them on the edge. It's kind of foldy and wavy. Do I see a, a, an annulus, a ring? Yep, there's a really clear ring. It's like a flaring little skirt there. And oh, gosh, I remember those chevrons. Remember I told you about the zigzag pattern at the top of the stipe? There it is. So I feel pretty confident here again. Um, this would obviously have cinnamon spores if you left it long enough. But many of these we want to eat younger. So I'm pretty confident this is Cotinarius caparatus. How about this one? Let's look at this. So we can't see the cap, but I looked at another one or two there, and I didn't really see the same kind of folds. It was upturned a bit, but that's all. I don't see a skirt. I don't see that annulus. And interestingly, the gills look a bit different too. They don't look so zigzaggy, and I don't see the pattern. So I'm not confident. And I think this is a cortinarius because of the, the, the spores dropping on the side, but I'm pretty convinced this is not a cortinarius caparatus. So I would disagree with that. And, and one other, this one was Cortinarius um, caparatus. But when I zoom in, what do I see on the bottom of the stipe? That does not look like an annulus. That looks more like a vulva, which is typical of an amanita. So, you know, the warning here is that Cortinarius caparatus can easily be mistaken if you don't look for the important features. And so, you know, I don't really encourage people to eat it. Here again, we're seeing this the challenge of differentiating. Uh, on the left, we have Cortinarius olympianus. So this is a purple court. And we often see it brought into our shows and ID as people saying, hey, can I eat this? Is this a bluet? And on the right, you can see what a bluet looks like. Now, obviously, when I've got them set up like this, it's pretty obvious. But when you're pretty new to mushrooming and you see the one on the left, it can be difficult to differentiate. And although Cortinarius olympianus is not so common, um, you are seeing the spores here, remember? And you are seeing that this has pinkish spores. But the overall shape might be similar. We also see people bringing in young Cortinarius trigenus and thinking that this is a purple edible mushroom. You know, can I eat it? Um, but Cortinarius trigenus is pretty easy to differentiate. And honestly, it's on my, my list of beginner's courts because it has some really um, easy standout features that mean you should never get it wrong. This is one that you should get out of the box. And so what I'm looking for with Cortinarius trigenus is um, purple. It can be kind of silvery when it's when it's dried. It's got abundant veil, so it's quite hairy. That fiber is very thick. Look how thick it is on the stipe. And the most important features, its flesh is browny, chestnut brown, even when it's young. It's not a feature of decay. It's actually a feature of the mushroom. And the gills are also this chestnut, rusty brown color, even when young. It never has a phase of purple gills. So if you think, huh, maybe this is just an old mushroom, a young mushroom, and that's why it's uh, you know a different color. No, the Cortinarius trigenus will never have um, purple gills, even when it's it's just in button form. Flesh uh, is going to be the chocolate brown, uh, sorry, the reddish brown, and so are the gills. So when we're looking at um, Cortinarius, there are also some that we need to avoid. Uh, luckily, there are not that many of these in our area, but since the distribution is poorly understood, it's important to watch out for these. And honestly, this is why our clubs normally say don't eat Cortinarius, because aralamine can cause renal failure. 
And there have been cases that have resulted in death in Europe, and I believe also elsewhere in the United States. And it's not one of these things that you feel a bit sick and you throw up and you're fine. There can be a long latency period where you're getting damage to your organs, um, and it can be difficult for, to have that cause and effect in order to get uh, treatment. So let's look at them. Cortinarius rubellus. I've, I've photographed these in the Northeast where they're much more common. Uh, you'll see the little umbo, this kind of overall yellowish look, um, and some of the girdles on the stipe. I mean, these look different, right? They look different to anything that we typically eat. So I'm not going to say put fear in you, but be aware of this, particularly if you were having dogs or you were traveling and people were asking about poisonous, uh, you know, mushroom edibility. These are something you just don't want to mess with. Uh, another species, Cortinarius aurelanosis, which was described in Michigan. And then you have on the left, Canaris, which is from Australia. Uh, now, all of these mushrooms, you get that yellowish look and the reddish gills. So just remember that kind of pattern and obviously avoid eating anything that has um, any resemblance to these. So now let's move away from the dire story of the, the sort of the terrors of Cortinarius and actually just focus on what I promised to teach you, which is Cortinarius identification. So let's say you are like most of us. And honestly, this is the bread and butter of a lot of our clubs as we try and teach people to recognize and identify mushrooms. How do we approach it? The first question is often like, what is the list? You know, when you're starting to build a identification or you, you want to know what to consider, you want to know how many there are and what could I be seeing? Now, when I look at Danny Miller's work, he started to build a list of all of the sequence confirmed Scotland areas. He has about 400 plus in the Pacific Northwest. But we certainly don't have 400 in our guidebooks. Uh, the guidebook that mentions most Cortin areas is Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, which I use here in Washington. It doesn't photograph all of them, but it refers to 102 species. If we look on iNaturalist, we have about 112 species concepts, not all verified. That's for the BC coastal region. If I expand it to inland or boreal, we'll go up, you know, maybe still under 200. And if I look at Danny's list only of sequences that are confirmed from BC, you know, we have a smaller number here. Um, so, you know, how, given that we have potentially so many and we have so few in our guidebooks, how should we approach identification? You know, how do we even start to chunk out and tackle such a big um, set of mushrooms? What I, I suggest and the approach that I have taken in learning them is to first notice distinctive species. That means things that are easy, recognizable, and quite definitive. So, you know, if, if there's somebody who lives next door and they have a bright reddish chihuahua, by all means, start learning the bright reddish chihuahua that lives next door to you. But beyond that, there's no point in you trying to learn all the 400, 200, whatever, caught in areas that are difficult to identify. For the rest of them, it's most important to look at groups that have similar characteristics. So if you recognize breeds or species or similar kind of categories, that is an extremely um, good strategy for you to start to name and narrow down the potential species that you could be seeing. And then as we sort of build out our identification and our databases from what's actually here, we'll be able to work on putting names to them through keys or other processes. So I'm going to show you some of the distinctive species and some of the groups and equip you to kind of take that next step. So when we talk about groups, uh, Cortinarius has had a long history of people trying to divide them up in meaningful ways. And for those of us who are not scientists or haven't been actually involved in mushroom taxonomy, you might think that there is a source of truth that we are inexorably heading towards. But the bad news is that that's really not the case. A lot of taxonomy is a point of agreement. It's a point of discussion about how to divide things up. So even with DNA, there can be multiple interpretations of where to draw the boundaries around a group or what to include in what section. So if you're seeing here, these four columns uh, represent some of our leading quaternarius experts in the world from the past, Mosia, Bedeau, Brandrud, and Kaufman. Some are still publishing. And you can see down the left, the groups or subgenera, that means the kind of big groups of quaternarius that they used and thought were meaningful. I don't want you to go and look at all of these and try and memorize them, but just look at the commonality and the variation. Some people thought there was a sister genes. Some people called things hydrosoby. Other people use bulbopodium. And some were saying paramyxaceum. 
But a lot of these are just not widely used, even though they were proposed as groups of quaternaries. So what are the groups that are most common today and that I think are going to be useful for you guys? These are the sections or subgenera that I find useful and that I use when I'm teaching people about quaternaries. Um, why I choose these is because they all have distinctive common features that can be seen often with the naked eye and that you can kind of walk with some confidence through the forest and say, that's a mixasium, that's a demosibi, and that's a telemonia. Um, and INAT will support you. If you want to identify something as a telemonia, you can do that because these are scientifically recognized subgenera or sections. So we're going to look at those names. You don't need to memorize them, but if you want to come back to this, I think these are useful things to have on your post-it notes and start to sort of get in your mind as concepts. Um, and I'm going to be using the terms and giving you examples of these as we go along. Okay, what are the common areas? Ah, let's see. So how I decide what's worth identifying as common is a little biased because I base it off what's most observed species on iNaturalist. And this is, again, coastal BC. So here's your top 10 in terms of the number of observations and the species. Of course, many of you will be saying, aha, but what we observe isn't necessarily what's out there. It's what we notice. And that's an absolutely a good point. So I'm going to give you some few things to maybe think about at the end, which should be on the list that maybe aren't. But we're going to discuss not one by one. We're going to discuss groups of these. And I'm hoping I can give you pointers to be able to identify all of these yourself. Um, when you're out and about in the forest this fall. So number one, Cortinarius violaceus. I'm hoping that if I was in the room with you, you could all raise your hand and identify this one by now. It's purple, it's got tomentose. I know you were discussing the words for hairy, but during the um, ID session, hairy, tomentose, it's fuzzy. It's almost like a fuzzy beanie. And it's this rich, deep purple. Look at the flesh. It's quite distinctive. Um, this is probably the best identified Cortinarius in our area. It's not abundant, but you know we we can pretty much all our clubs can identify this on our shows. So this is a good mushroom um, to have as your number one. I think it's number one not because it's most abundant, because it's not, because it's most noticeable. I mean, people look at it, and even non-mushroom people go, "Wow, what is that thing?" It attracts us with its distinctive um, appearance. So number two, hey, wow, we've talked about it already. So Cortinarius caparatus. Let's do our revision. Wrinkled cap. You're seeing the, the wrinkled cap here. The skirt, the annulus. It's dropped off. The, or it's a bit high up on this one. Some powdery surface on the cap. Um, and this little zigzag chevron pattern at the top of the stipe. So this is a really nice prime cortinarius caparatus. And remember, that these are both, as it happens to be, edible species. And again, I don't think that's just by chance. I think people have learned to see these things because maybe they are edible or maybe more visible. It's not necessarily about how abundant they are. The next most observed mushrooms are in what is called genus or subgenus mixacium. And when I started to do these talks, I got some feedback after a talk that I used the word moist a lot and that some people don't like moist. So I'm going to indulge myself in saying moist a great deal because mixacium are moist and slimy. They are, you know, they're that ooh, um, kind of mushroom. You see it on TikTok. You see it on social media with people licking them and showing these horrific strings of mucus. Um, you know, you can rub your finger on it and it's it's really like rubbing a gelatinous pudding. It's, it's quite of an experience. So here is a picture. You're seeing here slimy, moist, and it's mix. I use this as a mnemonic, even though it has probably has nothing to do with the name. When you think of mix, the cap, and the stipe are both moist and viscid. So it's not just the cap, because a lot of cordinarias have a moist cap, but to have the stipe and the cap moist mixacium. Now in the past, mixacium was thought to be an undifferentiated big group that was all in the same section. We've since found it's not the case. Some of them have what are called clamps. I'll show you a picture of that in a bit. And some don't. Um, some have purple and some don't. And you'll find that there are proposed different sections within mixacium. If you're starting out, don't even bother with that. Don't get distracted. The fact that you can get to viscid cap and viscid stipe tends to, takes you to a very relatively small list, maybe 20 areas. So it's a hugely useful feature to notice at this point. So your third most observed mushroom um, is this one here. 
um, is one of them. Sorry, I'm going to go to it now. Is um, this one here? This is uh, Cortinarius vanduzarensis, and the seventh most observed is Cortinarius uh, cydelii. So let's just look at those two mushrooms for now, and I'll show that there's actually a little bit of a problem. This is my photograph of Cortinarius vanduzarensis. Um, you can see it's a wonderful mushroom. Um, we know a great deal way we don't. Um, Cortinarius vanduzarensis is a mystery. Uh, despite all our sequencing in California, Pacific Northwest, and Canada, we have no confirmed observation of Cortinarius vanduzarensis. So wait, let's go back. We have lots of observations. I can't see from my slide here, but I think it's about 60. It's the third most observed mushroom in BC, but in fact, we have no confirmed data on it. And this is because there's a problem with Cortinarius vanduzarensis, and I'd like to encourage everyone here to stop using the name. Um, Cortinarius vanduzarensis is, has been sequenced. We have the sequence here. It's up at the top here from Michigan. It was sequenced in 2015. Um, but the only record we have of it is um, from the, the type. When we look at it, this is the, uh, the type um, description. You can see a photograph. You can see it's viscid in the cap, and it's got all this debris stuck on the stipe. So you can see that it's, it's viscid on the stipe. It was from spruce and hemlock at Cascade Head, Oregon, which is inland. And you know, I've got the description. It's got a glutinous cap. It's got some purple on it. Uh, the cap is chestnut black to chestnut brown, just like the Venduzarensis that you've been calling. It's corrugated. There's thick slime. It can be violet when it's young. Um, and the gills are pale, kind of a coffee color brown. But when we look at the, when that work was done on Venduzarensis, what they found was that Venduzarensis is actually quite different to what are called occult or really sort of similar species that are going under the same name. So instead of Venduzarensis being the widespread species, we actually found that a new species, which um, Dr. Joa Marathi named after Michelle Seidel, um, Cortinaria seidelii. And so in fact, what we are likely seeing in all these areas, in fact, our sequencing confirms that Cortinaria seidelii is the widespread species and Cortinarius vanduzarensis has not yet been collected again and sequenced from any location. So, you know, here again, this is the description of um, the difference between Cydelii and vanduzarensis um, and how you could differentiate. They say there's Brunia albus, which is similar to the two, visit cap, visit stipe, but it's brown. There's no purple on it, and it's a little shorter and stockier. Uh, vanduzarensis is only really known from the Tillamook County, Oregon, where it is the type location. And Silatetius is also similar, but it has a honey-like smell and it doesn't occur in our area. So I know that uh, Danny, me, and some of the um, microflora efforts have also identified another collection, which looks pretty similar, not exactly the same, and I'll show you it in a moment. Um, it also is going under the name Vanduzarensis, but again, it is not the same. So. Of these species, you know, this one here I saw is actually collected near the type location. Is this Vanduzarensis? This one hasn't been uh, sequenced. It fits the description. Um, and this is Cydelia, which is relatively close. Uh, but this has been sequenced, confirmed uh, as the actual Cortinaria Cydeliae, the thing that many people are calling Vanduzarensis. So, um, you know, basically, I, I think we should consider the three and seven as probably most of your species are Cortinarius cydelii and not Venduzarensis, but both are in the Mixaceum group, which is the slimy cap, moist, and slimy, slimy stipe, and some, some of them are purple. So um, slimy cap, slimy stipe, purple slime in cydelii and Venduzarensis. And they don't have clamps. So those of you into microscopy, the hyphae, when they join end to end, Sometimes there's this thing that's called a clamp. It's that little like hook that you see going over between uh, the two hypha, hyphae. And in Cydelia, there is no clamp. But in other parts of the Mixacean group, other groups within it, there are clamps. And I'll show you a few of those in a bit. So this is an example of something close to Venzuzarensis, that third species that we haven't got a name for yet. Um, and you can see the gills here look a bit different. So we're interested. This one still needs to be described. 
Here's a different um, one also in Lexacium. You're seeing the, the glutinous stipe. Imagine you're out there. Could you recognize the cap and the stipe as being viscid? Could you see that? You're already making a huge step in identifying Lexacium. Um, this one is trivialis. Um, and the next one, is a, this is clamped. So it does have the clamp. Um, and the next one is mucosis. And this only occurs with pine. You can see the same viscidity, but they look a bit different. And this actually is the 11th most observed um, or most named species in, in your BC region. So you obviously have a lot of these mixaceums and it's worth investing in a little bit of expertise on them. So purple mushrooms are the next group that we're going to talk about. Purple mushrooms catch people's eyes. Again, purple mushrooms are probably not that much more common, but they are um, observed a lot. And you'll see a lot of these incredible pictures of Cortinarius trigenus, which we've already discussed. Cortinarius trigenus, again, beautiful purple mushroom, heavy sheath, brown flesh, and brownish gills, even when they're young. But they can look a little, little different. In this case, it's a little more purple. Um, in some cases, they can be paler. Uh, and it can be an easy mushroom to look through our nets and just get your eye familiar with the features. Because it can be difficult, again, when you're in field and you're faced with so many purple mushrooms. Here are four species of purple mushroom. So how do we identify all these, um, all these species? How do we differentiate? One, two, three, four. Uh, in this case, you know, we're looking at uh, for, diff for familiar features in the, in the species. So on the left, you've got that, that slipperiness, that facidity. And this one is Cortinarius indelibuti called probably Cordinaria salo, but we don't have a name for it, it's undescribed. At the back, you're seeing a purple mushroom with splotches on it, darker purple splotches that people call bruising, and that is in the purpurescence group, it's Cordinarius occidentalis. The one in the middle uh, is actually Cordinarius camphoratus, and it smells, uh, it's called the goat cheese web cap, because it can smell so disgusting, like kind of stinky goats, imagine you're a goat farmer, it's the smell of the goat farmer's yard, mixed with a bit of a strong, heady cheese. And on the right, again, are uh, very uh, familiar and quite charismatic Cortinarius trigenus. So if you just sort of shut your eyes, just start to think, look, a purple mushroom, it's not all the same. Does it have purple gills or brown gills when young? That'll help you separate Camphoratus from trigenus. Does it smell? If it's stinky, that's Camphoratus. If it doesn't, it smells like pears, that can be trigenus. So again, we're just having to observe a few of these common features that help us separate out the really, I would say, quaternaria celebrities that people are more likely to notice and bring in for ID than the others. Is it slippery? Well, then it's not trigenus or camphoratus. It's going to be probably one of the mixacium or the uh, purpurescenti, which have a slippery cap. Does it have a slippery stipe? Well, then it's not a purpurescenti because they only have the slippery cap. So in a way, we're sort of loosely keying our way through um, these groups of purple or otherwise um, similarly featured mushrooms. Okay, so coming up for air, number five. This one, oh, this one was a tough one for me. I, I first saw it a lot about five years ago when I, my brain wasn't yet able to differentiate and recall the features as, as well as I do now. And it can be tricky because it's sort of pale. It looks sort of slippery. It's a little bit purple, and sometimes if you look at the button, it can be purplish gray. And so you can get easily confused about it. It's called albovioliaceous because it has that very characteristic of whitish violet. And when you see it on the East Coast, it can be very heavily sheathed and almost bulbous, whereas the species out here tend to be more elongate and the, the stacks are more cylindrical. So here's an example of a more you know, um, bulbous one. You can see it's very white. If we go back to the previous, you can see some are more gray, almost bluish gray. So be alert for the varieties and the ways that things show up in different um, in different conditions. When it's dry, obviously things will be drier. Uh, they'll be paler because it might be a bit hygrophonous. Um, but albovioliaceous is something you should think about if it's largish and pale um, and has this kind of wide, almost plain cap and maybe has some bluish colors. Albovioliaceous. It's worth sequencing if you have folks doing it because there are some similar telemonia that are large, that are also pale, that I think we've been mistakenly calling up violaceous. Um, and I'd say I rate myself a five out of 10 in that broad group, just because the number of species involved. 
Well, now if we were into the celebrity stakes, we're coming up into the, the top 10 in terms of Damasabi. Even though Damasabi are not the most observed, they're certainly the most um, sought after by dyers and artists. And they're incredibly beautiful mushrooms. I mean, these are often covers of guidebooks. They have people who are obsessed with them in Europe. Um, and they're incredibly complex because the color variation that can occur within a species overlaps. And so is not able to, you can't break them out just by pure, pure morphology. They're quite difficult to separate. So in these regard, what we've been calling them is, is basically we've been looking at the red guild, the orange guild, and the yellow guild. And only now, as we've started to do DNA sequencing, are we starting to understand the variety um, and starting to realize all the names that have been given to mushrooms that we haven't been using. So in your sixth most observed, it is Cortinaria smithii. Uh, nobody in our area is identifying this correctly. What we're calling smithii is partly ominosis or semi-sanguineous, who knows what. Um, and this one, semi-sanguineous group, is being completely merged with the, the concept of um, smithii. To separate them out in any way, you're going to need a UV flashlight. So a little uh, one with about 365 nanometer wavelengths. Don't go to the 390s that you often get for dog urine. And if you had these two mushrooms next to each other, these are genetically confirmed. This one does not have UV fluorescence on the stack. It is smithii. It can look vivid red. It can look yellowish red. Don't you know? It, it is very variable and a little bit changed in conditions. This one has a very short stipe, and I thought it was something else. Um, but this does have UV fluorescence on the stipe. So a very easy check. If you've got something bright red like this with no UV fluorescence, call it smithia. And if you've got it with UV fluorescence, say, I don't know what the hell it is. That's my recommendation right now. Um, and I don't know what the hell it is because we need expert work on this, what we're calling the semi-sanguineous. You can call it aminosis. You can call it tinctorum. I mean, just depends who you're backing at this point. But the, you know, the data is confusing. And we will need someone to do some serious uh, phylogenetic work before we can unpack it. So don't beat yourself up if you can't break this group up. But you should be able to get smithy eye. Smithy eye is red girls, reddish to orangish burgundy cap, and does not have UV fluorescence on the stone. So these are all beautiful. Um, dyers don't care what species it is. They'll throw them all in the basket. They all give you beautiful water-based dyes that can make really vivid colors on silk and colors that are hard to get from other natural products. So the red in particular is, is you know, one of my favorite dyes. So what we typically do is anything that's orange guild, we call cinnamomious. <laughs> it's just the best we can do right now, but I'm hoping we can improve and find some other features to separate them. Um, this is the ninth most observed. So you have eight, six, eight, and nine, all demosophy. And then number four was, actually, I don't know if that was four. I think that was 10, is, is a crocius. So this is the, the, the what is often called the yellow, um, here you go, the, the yellow guild. But the yellow guild ones, I've collected crocius, actual crocius, and the mature ones look orange, and I've collected some ammonius, and the, the young ones look more yellowish. So it's not incredibly easy to separate them. <clears throat> you will see with crocius that it's almost blackish yellow on the cap, if you look on the young button. And it's a more of an acid yellow, Whereas the cinnamomias, you can see that even in the young buttons, it has more of this warm um, orangey cadmium type of color. So I would use that as a guide, but these are going to need sequencing um, and possibly further work. In occasional cases, I get lucky and I find that's called something like viridirescence, viridirubescence, or it might be um, you know, other notable species, but it's always a surprise and honestly a present to me when I get a name off a Damasavi because I'm not yet at the point of being able to identify many of the non-red ones myself. The red ones I can I can get pretty well. Um, these ones here with the blackish fibers, you'll see on the top it's orange, but the cap is blackish fibers. I think of it as having a bit of a black mop on top. Um, you know, just imagine out of a hat there of black, and the flesh is a little black in the cap. Um, those are often malachorius group. Uh, so if you want another name, malachorius is one that's turning out to fit quite well. Here you can see them again, a whole range 
of these yellowish gilled ones, top left metachorius. But, you know, we, we just need to get to recognize them as gemosity, skin heads. So I've shown you the top 10. I mean, I'm sure you all have these down now and can identify at least a few more or can get to mixasium, can recognize it a massive, can think about the features of caparatus. But many of the common courts out there that I see every season are not in that list. So here are just a few that I think probably should be in the list. This one here um, is a telemonia and it's called Cortinarius decorum. It grows with cottonwood or poplars. And it's a little bit of a, a it's hygrophonous. It means it changes in different conditions. If it's wet or dry, it can be quite dark capped. It can be light capped. But you almost think, well, this thing's browned out. It used to be different. It didn't. It, it always looks like this. And one of the features I've noticed isn't so clear in this picture, but it often looks like it's got a little egg in the center of the cap. It's slightly yellow or brownish in the center and paler on the margins. And it has these very faint watery fiber-like look in the cap. It's big and stout. It often is gregarious. I mean, there's carpets of it. Um, and remember, poplar or cottonwoods, populous. So it's a little bit of an unusual habitat for many of us. The second one is Cortinarius reederi, a brilliant mushroom. Wasn't named at all for years um, in our area. And then we find it was in a book, but nobody could recognize it from the picture. And now we have a, a type description of it. And you can see it's this amazing purple gills. Very erect stack with a bit of purple in it. This brown kind of slightly watery cap. Watery, I mean, it looks like it's got a pressed fibrils in it. Um, and this really kind of lovely bulbous type. So keep your eye out for Cortinarius reederi. I see it pretty much every season. Um, and it's quite a splendid mushroom. It's something that you kind of feel you ought to be able to name. Um, Joe Maradi warned me this is a tough one because it changes. It does. It looks a bit different. It fades. It can be quite dark. Um, it's a tricky mushroom, but you know, it's. I think it is because of how abundant it is. I think it's worth um, worth trying to identify. I can attest to how difficult it is because in the early days, it was costing me thirty five dollars per sequence, and I sequenced this thing like seven times <laughs> because I couldn't recognize it. So I kept doing it again and going, "Whoa, this thing looks like that now. It looks like that now." And uh, Noah finally said to me, "You just got to stop sequencing reader right." So I think I'm there now. And the final one, Cortinarius albuglobosus. Another one, you see how kind of dull it is? And I think these brown colors just don't attract our photographic eye as much. But albuglobosus, globose white, is probably one of the most abundant uh, Cortinarius in court season. And I see it widespread. It doesn't just occur in sort of the cascades. I see it lower down. Um, and it's frequently brought in and people think, oh, it's a browned out court, used to be another color. Nope. Uh, for this one, look for its white patches on the stipe, this heavy veil. There's a lot of fiber. And so, um, yeah, it, it can be something that you might identify through the brown cap and just really fibrous and abundant kind of roundy look. So the other thing that should be on the list, but well, you know, so we're not going to go there is telemonia. So within Telemonia, there was a paper done recently. Telemonia means this huge group of brown, Cortinarius. Uh, birders have a word for it, LBBs. My dad used to call them little brown buggers. And I think we could call the Telemonia the LBBs of the Cortinariaceae. Um, but as you get closer to them, and if anyone say interested in Mycena, this might be your challenge. They are things that are difficult. They're hygrophonous, so they change color as they, the conditions change. Uh, but they all are these beautiful tones of brown that range from purple to yellow. Um, and there's huge diversity. There are 800 species simply in this Cortinarius telemonia type paper. So here's photographs. Each of these slides recommend, represents a section. That means a group that has common features, um, common ecology. Oh dear, just as we're getting into it. Um, we lost Shannon, I believe. Oh no. You lost me for a second. Oh, there you are. Hello, <laughs> I need welcome to back. Again. Let's see if my, is my sharing gone? Whenever you're ready, I'm, I'm, I was just writing everything down frantically, so this is good. <laughs> there you go, everyone take a breath, swig your brandy, whatever it takes to get you to Cornarius. <laughs> 
For all these brown ones, yes, I will need that. Yeah. No, I, I look, there's a role for, for whiskey in our lives. It's just when you read the telemonia type paper at bedtime. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to read this, it's it'll, you know, it does blow your mind a bit. So everybody here can get access. It's free on the, on the web, caught in areas, telemonia type paper. And it's like pages and pages long. A lot of it is just sort of explanation. And then it has these beautiful photographs attached where it shows all the sections of telemonia. And here you don't need to do this, but sometimes just out of curiosity, it's interesting to know the labor that's going into this, this part of the genus. And you, again, I don't know these area, these sections. I'm starting to know certain groups here. Like you start to see like this ones that have purple on it, Saturnini. I'm starting to see the ones that are very brown, darkish brown, the bovine. I think it means cow. I hope it doesn't mean cow, but I think bov bovine means cow. Um, so I, I am interested in learning these sections, but it's on my it's on my list. I'm not there yet. So um, a lot of opportunity for people who are interested in discriminating these really challenging species. I collect these ruthlessly because, you know, what does the public see? It sees the beautiful, the parrots. And these are the sparrows. And they're 800 or more. So let's learn the species that are out there in our area. Um, if we don't collect them, you know, we're never going to find out. And in, in fact, we have a very high return on new species when we sequence um, telemonia. Um, you do need to collect them fresh just because we can't describe and work on species of really browned out specimens because we don't know what the features are. Okay, let me see if I can move. So I'm almost there. You've almost made it. I have a very short section now, just as a teaser for those who are interested in Cortinarius taxonomy. And that telemonia piece was the bridge. You know, if you got through that, you're ready for just hearing a little bit about the taxonomy of Cortinarius. So over the past 20 years, people might think that I'm picking the hardest genus or genera. But honestly, in many ways, I'm picking the easiest now that we're in the genetic age because so much investment has been made by mycologists around the world in Cortinarius that we have the types sequenced. Think of it as a, a database of the fingerprints of our mushrooms. Because the fingerprints are there of the described species, if you get a fingerprint that's new, you can be relatively confident that it's actually a novel species. Whereas in many genera, the foundation of those types, the early species described in the 1800s, 1900s, or decades prior, haven't been sequenced. And so somebody has to establish those concepts and know what they are and represent today before we can do new genetic work and describe new species. So Cortinarius, it's excellent here. The papers, they're just a, a taste of the papers published describing all these groups of, of Cortinarius that I've been telling you about. The Prosopi, Anomaly, uh, the Talamonia, the Phlegmaceans, the Calinarius, all around the world, this work has been going on with the genetic backbone. Um, that has now led to taming the beast. I mean, Cotinarius, you've got to give us a lot of drama. The last page of papers were titled Mission Impossible, Unlocking Telemonia, and now Taming the Beast, Revising Cotinarius based on genetic data or genomic data. And what this latest paper proposes is a split of Cotinarius into 10 genera. So many of you have suffered through the splits of Belitz and maybe heard about the splits of Anasabi and the splits of other genera. And now the same process of revision is being proposed. It's not inevitable, but it's being proposed by some of the leading experts on Cortinarius. And they're proposing this, 10 genera. So if we look at this pie chart, this is all of the Cortinarius species that they included um, as an estimate in the paper. And I just put it into a pie chart. So you can see they're still proposing the majority of species will stay in genus Cortinarius, but they're nine other genera. Um, some of them are bigger, Dexterogaster and Phlegmacium um, and Calinarius, and some are skinny and tiny, Cystinarius and Bulvarius, Mystinarius and Ostracortinarius. And some don't really occur here, like Evolvinarius and Ostracortinarius are more southern. So this is the proposal. Um, science and taxonomy are like a conversation. They're an argument or discussion among people working in the field. So to some extent, we can choose to adopt or not um, these new ways of naming and placing species. But I think it's important to be aware because you'll start to see these names already populate through iNaturalist. So now when I search for all the Cortinarius in a region, I don't search Cortinarius in Northwest. 
a cert called Teneriaceae because a lot of the things have already been transferred into Texterra gaster and Phlegnaceae. And in fact, the same species might be split between Texterogaster and Phlegmes and Cortinarius in the INAF database. So this is just showing you on the left, this is how it used to be. Cortinariaceae is the big family, the biggest umbrella. And underneath is Cortinarius and Stephanopus, which wasn't based in any, we haven't got sequences yet. But in Cortinarius, we had all these proposed subgenera. And if you remember back in the beginning of my talk, I talked about all those experts like Bidot and Mosia who proposed different groups and how they didn't always agree. But these were some of the lists that they proposed. Those weren't all based genetically. Now, on the basis of genetic consensus and modeling, we have these new proposals. This, for example, would be one of them, Orionarius. And here I've made just a little tree to show you how this changes how we name species. So the genus is no longer Cortinarius on the left, it's Orionarius. And then in Orionarius, they propose two subgenera, Calisti and Orionarius. Gets a bit overloaded with Orionarius after a while. And then under Calisti, there'll be two groups or sections, Colibiani and Calisti. And then under the sections, you'd have the species. So it's actually quite a linear, like a library catalog way of dividing up where the species fall based on their genetic relationships. Um, Orionarius, you can start to see. Now, these are actually species. I've put in pictures, like a little postcard representing each section and some of the species. And you can start to see, like, this looks familiar, right? They all look kind of similar. They're yellowish. They've got this kind of glabrous cap. Um, they're smallish. They haven't got bulb, big bulbs. And so this is a successful case, right? Because I could start to say, well, hey, that looks like an Orionarius. I don't know what section, but it's an Orionarius. And it's a small enough group that that could be meaningful. But, you know, as you see these things starting to appear on INAC, not all of the groups or the new genera are as easy to recognize. So these are examples of phlegmasium. You can see that things used to be Cortinarius variosimilis is now phlegmasium variosimili. And um, some things are just being put into section because people think it's a phlegmasium, but they don't know which one. That looks actually bottom left like a glycopoid. So that would be glycopodi. Um, some others, again, successful in the sense that they help us identify. They are meaningful groups for people to recognize. Cystinarius. Um, Cystinarius are basically rupicundulus. If you've been to California, Cortinarius rupicundulus. Um, Rubiginosus is the West Coast species. They bruise, often yellow, and they have this yellowish look. Um, and in, interestingly, they're one of the very few cortinarias that have cystidia on the gill face. It's like a big non, um, it's a sterile cell. It's just a big inflated cell on the side of a of the gill surface when you look at it in the microscope. Um, they have small spores. So these are features, again, if you were trying to get big groupings understood, maybe cystinarius is useful. But Cortinarius, remember the pie chart? It's like three quarters of the pizza. This has still got way too many species for it to be a, a, a group that in itself is useful. Um, the subgenera, though, are very distinctive. So underneath um, Cortinarius, you'll have the Domasibi, the Leprosibi, which uh, in the center picture, those are UV positive, and the moist and slippery Mixasium. So under Cortinarius, there are subgroups that you can still find um, that are actually well supportive and have type papers and in many cases keys that will enable you to get your head around them if you choose to focus on them. Um, Phlegmasium includes Glaucopodes and Bulbopodium. What a beautiful name. Um, unfortunately, it's not the only group or subgenus that has bulbous base, but Calinarius also have a bulbous base. But this includes things like um, the Glaucopodes, Baltiatus, and some of these really classical looking cortinarius that are you know, well described in, in our guidebooks. And finally, the most, um, well, I'd, I'd say possibly historically the most loved of the cortinarius, particularly in Europe, are the calinarius. They are often have these really beautiful bulbs. They're brightly colored um, and they have a bright KOH reaction. So if you carry dilute potassium hydroxide, about three or five percent in your pocket, screw it on tight or like me, you'll burn a hole in your pants and get a sore leg. Um, drip it on the cap of the mushroom just to test and it'll have a bright reaction. Right. Pink in this case, magenta. It could be red, um, could be burgundy. 
And that bright KOH reaction is common to Demosibi in a slightly different way and the Calinarius or um, what used to be um, Quaternarius, uh, but now Calinarius. And they are interesting and well-documented because they occupy rare and narrow ecological niche niches, particularly in Europe. They're often on red lists because they're restricted to, say, oak zones or specific oak habitats. And they're quite a lot of really beautiful examples from California and also from Southern California. Here's one that we get in our region. You have Quaternarius Calinarius olympianus. I've seen it collected in your area. It's often associated with old growth. I don't see it commonly, but um, it's very distinctive when you do see it because it has this kind of slightly tacky, putty-like uh, cap that's pale pink, these pinkish gray-violet gills, marginate bulb, and it has this beautiful violet K uh, magenta KOH reaction, which can enable you to identify it with confidence. And it used to be in what was called calicroid section in Cortinarius, and now it's just the subgenus calicroid. Um, and finally, I think, whoop, yeah, is Thexterogaster. So this is the other genus that we have here. Um, it's a really fairly easy one to identify because they have these kind of brownish, white, purple, white, brown, but often brownish um, caps. And several have a honey odor, um, paler gills, and no KOH reaction. And also some of them are better. So I always encourage you to lick or nibble Cortinarius and spit it out. Um, the licking is an important diagnostic factor for a lot of the bitter species, um, like the subtorti and, and the infracti group, um, and also important for identifying vibratiles, these little kind of honey brown capped um, species that are smaller than this, but in the same section and are highly bitter to the tongue. I mean, it quite, can be quite a dramatic taste if you just lick them. So I'm, what my work is right now is to try and, in a sense, get verified collections that are well photographed so that we can continue to add to the list of recognizable species in our area. Um, I'm putting them on my website, nacourts.com. Um, it has only about 75 species. I keep saying my goal is 100 by the end of the year. Maybe this year I'll hit it. Um, but everything on there is genetically supported. So you're not just getting someone's opinion about what it is you're learning exactly what the thing looks like. And I try to add additional examples um, as time goes on. You can also filter iNaturalist for genetically verified collections. As long as the people have updated the name, um, it can be another really great way of you getting to see what things actually look like. Um, I'm, you know, I as I, I also manage a group on Facebook, which is called the Cortinarius, Cortinarius North American Cortinarius ID Group. Um, so feel free to join that if you're on Facebook. Um, and I'm also open to answering questions if anyone wants to just reach out to me personally by email. Uh, expect me to take a little bit of time because I have a full-time job. I'm always happy to discuss things, particularly if you get them sequenced. So at that point, I'd love to stop. I hope I haven't gone too long. Um, and, you know, really open this up for questions from anybody. Thank you so much, Shannon. I really appreciate that. That was absolutely amazing. So far, just brilliant. I do believe there have been a couple questions online here, but they may have actually already been answered. Um, but why don't you weigh in? Is it reliable to sequence a 40-year-old holotype? Yeah, it's reliable, but it might not get a result. So <laughs> if you get a, a clean sequence, it's reliable. Um, I wouldn't send those through to the public sequencing things, the um, efforts though, without without um, contacting the folks first. I know Stephen Russell is starting to sequence the holotypes from Michigan for his for things he's interested in, and uh, we do have a local lab in Portland um, who can handle old specimens as well. So it, yeah, it depends. Oh, fair. Um, and then. I don't know if uh, Alabama Mushroom Society is still around. You had a question about the Demosophy. Are you still around? Do you want to ask your question? I was. Yeah, I was just wondering. We had switched from the subgenera, and we were talking about some specific species, and I wasn't sure if they were still in the Demosophy subgenus or um, not. But it's fine. We don't have to go back through. And yeah, the bright colored ones, I can go back if you're interested. Um, yeah, all of those groups, I'll go Demosibi. I wonder if I can. 
I love, I mean, Damasabi, I've often threatened people I know. I've threatened that I'm going to do a personality test for people based on the questions <laughs> they like. It's going to be like one of those sort of pop quizzes you get in old magazines. Um, <laughs> but I think that there's a certain extroversion with Damasabi. I mean, they're, they're flamboyant. Um, so let's see. So these are... I'm going to whiz back. I don't know why I didn't square from where I wanted to be. Boom, 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 close your eyes. <laughs> okay. Um, here, these are all Damasabi. So if we go from these are all Damasabi. So what we're looking at here is this brighter, kind of more chrome-like acidic colors. Um, if we go back to this, see, it's pallid. And we look here, and these are bright. So all of these have that intense color in the gill, particularly the gill, because a lot of other species have bright, might have bright caps, but the caps are dry and they have this fiber, you know, the derm, the skin. I think by, and you think of skin, the fine, fine hairs you have on your forearm, the cap has that finely oppressed fibrillose feeling. It's just slightly different. So if you look at it closely, it might almost look slightly felted, not fully felted, that would be more leprosophy, but slight, not scaly, just finely felted kind of skin on its head. And here you see the wet, but look at the little bumps. You can see that fine feltiness almost on the surface. Here again, you can see that sort of, they're not shiny so much because they have this furry felty cap on the head and the bright girls. But thanks for asking. Yeah, Lecorum is in Telemonia. It's not a typical, I mean, people used to think Telemonia was all brown, but it's not. Some of them are big and white. Um, some of them are purplish. And Lacorum is a sneaky one that it can look purple as well. Next question, Shannon. Uh, if you take the same species of Cortinarius and put it under a different tree, does a different soil chemistry alter the morphology in certain ways? You know, we don't think the tree, because it won't, it's ectomycorrhizal, so it has its it's limited to the kinds of trees that it will mm -hmm. form a relationship with. Although increasingly we're seeing some that look like they can switch a bit. And so I think there's going to be a lot more interesting ecology work looking at it includes mushrooms in the ecosystem um, to see if those are the same species or how much, you know, how much um, difference we can see in, in the relationships that they are forming or exactly what they are forming relationships with, because in some mixed forests, we're not always, we're not always sure. Um, for what I am interested, because I travel a lot, I'm interested in how things look different in different areas. So in Alaska, Tregenus is vivid. I mean, maybe because it's because it's moist. Is it because the the mass is so deep? They are big and immensely bright. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, I often see them probably because we have more dry spells. They're paler and they get more shaggy. They're a little smaller. Um, caps are a little smaller. They just they just look a little different. And the same kind of thing, the folks who who find king bolites, you see them, and even though we're told they're the same thing, they there is a lot of morphological variation by region. So I see re I see regional differences in albo global um albo violaceous, um, and and quite a few of these species. And I think it's yet to be understood how similar the species is it evolving is it slightly different in different regions or is it the ecology of those places that's causing that difference in, in um, appearance and it's strange you mention that because i'm thinking of some areas up on the midwest coast of our island for Tregenus, and I've, i'm quite sure i've seen what i would assume is a large version of it yeah but then i don't know if that's what it is or <laughs> So you never know, right? We are not I think all. You can. I think that's what you, the, the nice thing is that you can start once we combine that kind of recognition that you're talking about, which is exactly what we should trust. We should trust our guts. I mean, because you are right. You're seeing something similar. You don't have to doubt yourself. I'm seeing something that looks like this. I am. Um, and the other hand, we, we start to support it with just the curiosity of genetic sequencing. And we can say, well, this thing looks the same, but it isn't. But those can be separate lines of inquiry. You know, we can say, I see three things, they all look like this. And for now, that's excellent. That's all we need to do. It's why I'm happy calling things Cortinarius crocius. Um, I'm not feeling a terrible sense of failure if I call all yellow gill Demosity crocious. Of course they aren't. <laughs> but for now, that's the best we can do. Yeah, that's fair. There's interesting, you uh, mentioned that Cortinarius, the one that starts with V um, instead of the S, the Vanderusens. Vanderusens. 
Fenders. Yeah, that one. <laughs> um, we, I, I find areas where there's so many of those. You must have so many because we just don't see them that much down here. Oh, there are I think you could do a mission on them. Oh, for sure. I could. And then we found some again at a, before a particular workshop that we took a few weeks ago. Um, and we're getting it sequenced. Yes. So, so yeah. <laughs> Tell me. I'd love to know what happens. And I've been very curious. It's been about three or four years since I last found this massive area that has a bunch of them. And I've been, I could not like figure it out morphologically. So it'll be interesting. And it was interesting to hear your um, expertise on those particular ones to know, hey, actually, that might not be what it is. Yeah, that was very no, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. I mean, I asked Noah about this when he's like, yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> the fact is that, that that we can't recognize them yet and we need some other species named. Um, oh. Danny Miller commented that, unfortunately, the when they chose the type for Venduzarensis from Oregon, they chose the least common species to name. And all these ones that are really widespread are not included in the, that holotype. You know, they're not in collections. Who knows? <laughs> Who started that? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who started that? Um, but we have some more questions. The next one is, does UV light testing work on dried specimens? And what about KOH on dried specimens? You know, I should have tried it. KOH, I, it might work a bit, but it's not as good because they darkened. They darkened. Yeah. Um, but I think you might get a reaction. The, the um, UV does. It's slightly different. It's less intense. So... If I can still get UV reactions from my Damasa bee when I shine on them, but they're a little less intense. It's almost like the water, you know, improves the reaction. But you can mm -hmm. certainly see the stipe base. So there's a Cortinarius called Cortinarius bridgii that is very common in spring. It's a little brown thing. But how wonderful to be able to identify a little brown uh, Talimonia with absolute confidence because it has this orange UV stipe base. Mm. It's pretty bland. It's got a white stipe and a brown cap, and it's like every other little spring um, telemonia. But you shine a UV light, and its base goes almost salmon orangey pink. Wow. So that's wonderful. And that does it dry. Sometimes I'll get that spidery feeling. I don't know. I put it in this quaternary spa in my notes. And then at the night, I suddenly go, oh, my God, of course it's Bridgia. And I go and shine, and it goes orange, um, even though it's dried. So those kind of tips, always try it. It just might not be as intense. Oh, that's really cool. I haven't tried that yet. I'm always obsessed with my little, <laughs> my <laughs> yeah, little tricks. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. All right. So, um, Bri from Langley says, thank you so much. You really enjoyed this talk. Um, and another question about UV lights is 365 NM beneficial to more than just lagrospe and dermosopy? Um, well, if you want to be a cool kid, apparently well, you need a UV light because hey, that's all Instagram blows up on is yeah. apparently you shine in, shine UV light at everything, including your dog, and it'll turn a color. But um, yeah. if you are realistically focused, if the con question context is quaternarius, yes, yes, they are beneficial to others. Um, just because we're starting to see things that we didn't know were significant with UVR. I um, mean, you know, I was shining at a, a table of, of tricholoma a few years back, and we found that two species that looked very similar had different uh, UV reactions. So I think we're still discovering now that we have more of these lights. For courts, I don't, I'm trying to think. Yeah, they are. Like some of the spring um, cortinarius, the, the spring telemonia are this all based on UV. It's not just leprosity. There's a strong, um, there's a key that includes the UV light on the stipe and cap for some of our spring, uh, spring telemonia. I don't know, I'm blanking right now on the names of the sections. Um, but it's, yeah, some of our very common species, I use UV for them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You do get 365, not 39, just because that's the one that um, is used in all the descriptions. So mycologists are using that wavelength. And surprisingly, you get a, quite a different reaction when you put 395 versus 365. So if you want yeah. to compare to descriptions, use 365. Even 355, I've tried once. Really? That's um, very low. Mm. And it it's just a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Show some different things. <laughs> and it depends what brand you get, too. 
Um, Alan Rockefeller has a fluorescence Facebook page and he has some very great information on there. If anyone's ever looking for a UV flashlight, he has it all spelled out there. So head over there. He'll give you all of the details you need. My only Um, advice is just keep it in your mushroom kit. Do not go to your bathroom. (laughs) Or your bedroom. Okay. Well, I haven't done that. I haven't even gone there, but. Or a hotel room. You don't just don't. Just don't. Just don't. Um, okay, so on that topic, um, Tyler asked, what is the status for the iNaturalist tax on SWEP? Um, started, mm-hmm. He started to into it last year. Um, is there any way to help wrap it up of sorts? I'm guessing just to try and support the AI that's going in there. Oh, yeah, and just like system areas right now, right? It, it's it's like blank, right? And then there's some, some mm-hmm. species in multiple places, I think. So stuff like that. I was just curious. I don't want to know it. I'm not close enough to, it, it might be worth if you know, like someone over there who works in mushrooms. Like I know, um, yeah, I'm just blanking again on the names of the folks involved. Like Nicholas, I think in Germany is. Oh, Nicholas Schwab. Schwab. That's yeah. right. I would reach out to him and ask him because yeah. I'm not sure if they make the swaps global or if they're doing them regionally. Um, I do know, and this is no, no disrespect to folks in the area, but INET, Visual AI is very bad in BC. It's it's really shitty. Like yeah. I I think it's because we don't have enough things identified. Yeah. And so we just need to get a broader base of the training. Or when you look at put something on it, don't go for the scene locally. Um so always default to scene anywhere and see if you can, you know, obviously eliminate the species that are. Um, overseas or whatever, but I think you might get a better result just because it seems to be very bad. It's telling me some quite ludicrous things. Um, yeah, that's the unfortunate part. I need. I would love to weigh in because that's why our club and Vancouver Mycological Society is trying to really weigh in and be a part of iNaturalist is to try and get that base data in there to try well, and I'll help. help. I'll go through and do some code right. changes, but let's, yeah, I, but I think it would be, you know, it's always, I work in tech and I think it's important for us to use our efforts wisely. So, we don't want to manually go and shift things if they can move everything. Like if we can, True. like if, I mean, there's 65 Vendries Arensis. If they can move, somebody can move those all to Cydelli. I think we're making a significant improvement right now. Cause that's a good point. Yeah. Um, or, you know, there might be changes. I don't know if we want the new genera, um, but certainly, <laughs> yeah, if, if, if they're split, it's a mess. We certainly shouldn't have them split. Like mm. half the scenarios and half court and areas. It's just confusing. <laughs> that would be a messy, very messy. Um, let me see. All right. So did we do there's a lot of court and areas? Pat asked um, why the UV light. I don't know, Pat. Maybe if I bet it's in one of the descriptive papers in Leprosibi. There's pro- maybe it's Leprosibin, the chemical that's in there is reactive. Um, but it's probably different things in, it could well be different things in different genera. I would love to know. Um, I believe there is leprosybin. It's like anything that has phosphorus in the compound will be fluorescent. Yeah. Did you say phosphorus? Yeah, it's phosphorus, I believe. Any phosphorus compound, like you said leprosybin, I think that's one of them. But I'm not an expert either. Just to no, so I learned something. Majors. That's also, I didn't know it was phosphorus based. And once again, like Alan Rockefeller's Facebook page. <laughs> I told you it's the cool kids, but um, okay. <laughs> I'm into functionally doing it. I think that, yeah, they are very beautiful. And I, I certainly have started to take photographs showing the UV features. But the interesting thing is when you can use it, not just go, oh, this is beautiful. It's actually yeah. functional. It's really important in, in these genera and these species. Yeah. Um, Emma, yes, you did. That's a Trigenus. Excellent. Perfect. Yes. There are a couple of questions just above that. That uh, the dermatosis bees react differently to KOH, and what is their reaction? The mosses bees, um, not all of them are the same, but a lot of them have a bright red or wine red KOH reaction. And so that's a nice feature. The trick with them is that if you put too much on, it looks almost black. So you might want to just dab a tissue or dab a bit of paper onto the surface to see what the color is. Because with the furry cap, 
it's not as easy as with the contornarius olympianus to see the beautiful color, but the color can still transfer into a bit of tissue or something. So it can look black, but it's actually a deep pur vinaceous purple in many species. Um, a random court question from Juliet. Has Cortinarius hercinicus been reabsorbed into violaceous, or does it still exist? I will try and answer that. I thought it still did. I mean, Emma's work was the latest. I don't focus as much on these because um, in our area we have a only a few. When I look at um, when I was in Australia uh, or New Zealand, um, I looked at several. I'm just looking up high. Uh, mycotaxin, yeah. I'll have to see. I can get back to you on that. Um, for collection photos, is it okay to composite different angles into the same photo? I mean, that's I would say. Really, that's what I do. <laughs> you look at mine. Because yeah. if you are thinking about, would think about what you're using the photo for. If it's for INAT, you just want to have give somebody the most information possible so that they could describe or recognize it later. It doesn't matter because they can flip through five, six, ten photographs. Mm -hmm. I, I really encourage people to take a photograph of the environment and cap mm -hmm. and flip it and chop it and, you know, do whatever, smell it. Uh, but if you're thinking of a guide or you're wanting to show one or two slides, it's really useful to have them all in one view. So if you look at Christian and Noah's books, they manage to get hundreds of mushrooms in those books simply because each photograph shows you enough information to make a good diagnosis. Um, and, you know, with paper making so many good observations, you got to think maybe your club one day wants to have a little regional guide. Um, and then you want to, you know, put more descriptive photographs um, together. And if you find only two to three samples, I do it with one sample, then I just cut it in half from the get go because, hey, it doesn't look as, as photogenic, but you get the inside, you get from the underside and you can have one this way and one line down. Um, but you know, then it's up to you. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Martin. Many of the photos showed serrated gill edges. Is that random across the subgenera, or is it characteristic of any particular one? That's a good question. I think with Cortinarius caparatus, it definitely is. I haven't seen it as much of a characteristic. I haven't actually typically. I'll get back to you on that one too. I'll, I'll explore it. I think that in most cases they are smoother, but in some talimonia I've seen it described um, and I certainly see it in caparitis. But other than those two, it's not jumping out at me, but I could be wrong. There are a lot of thank yous, but there's also an, an amazing photograph of a bright yellow UV lit Quartinarius here. Mm, that must be a leprosity. That's the a clandestinus, possibly. I'd love to okay. see it without all the color because it, clearly it's very up. Ah, there it is. Yeah, I'd guess this is Cortinarius clandestinus or maybe one of the other. There's a really good leprosity key now um, in the leprosity paper. When I say leprosity paper, uh, with Cortinarius, with so few being in the guidebooks, you need to think about papers as your source of data, not, not uh -huh. people or books. It's The books are no good. You need the papers. So, for example, um, I'm just going to see if I can share it with you. Um, but you need to be, I actually have these all on my website. I think there's a, a link. Um, and a lot of these papers are available and you can look at them. I'm going to just see if I can give you the link here. Here's the link to download the lepro leprosity paper. Whoop. If I can successfully do this, we'll see. I'm just going to paste it in here. Um, this is just a journal. So you could go there, for example, and um, download in the right. I think it's free here, open source. And that'll have a key in it for the prosody. And then you could, whoever found that, should be able to identify it. And you need to do that for all of the, the things. You could look up anomaly type paper. Um, uh, let's see if I can get that one. Um, and then oh, each of these. Thank you for that. Things. That's always really. Yeah. That's always the confusing part is, yes, we have a lot of field guides and a lot of textbooks out there that are attainable, but then 
when you're describing all these subgenuses, it's like, oh boy, there's so much more to learn. And how do you figure it out for some of us that don't have access to all these scientific papers all the time? You do. Honestly, everyone here can get access. There's several ways. There's um there's a group on Facebook where people share literature. So folks in libraries will share literature. Um, majority of these type papers are actually published open source, so straight to consumer because the people doing the work want people to adopt what they're learning. And uh, you know, these ones I recommend in particular because they US include mm-hmm. US data, they include species that nobody will be knowing and using, and there's a robust key. So with a simple microscopy, and unfortunately, a lot of them use spore size, but do not despair. I'm sure there's somebody who can help with a little bit of a spore examination. And uh, you can actually start to use new names without any genetic work. You know, you don't have to sit there and wait for someone to sequence your stuff. You can use a key. These keys in the area that have been studied are pretty robust. And these keys, Ellen requests, are these the keys that you're talking about in these particular papers then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they have photographs. I mean, I, I don't use guidebooks much at all um, for, for court and areas. Actually, no one in Christians is good. If I go to California, I use it all the time. Um, and I certainly, I did use it in my area. I think it was the best. Uh, but, you know, I just use these papers now all the time. And I use iNaturalist and look at what sequence and I go, huh, that's interesting. But uh, I can get to group. So how, how I'm thinking about it. Well, I can get to group. Like I've showed you, mixacium, they're very slippery. They haven't got a type paper yet, but it's coming. So don't despair, it's coming. Mm-hmm. Within the next few years, we should have some stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but you get an anomaly, which is a slippery cap, and it's very pale. It's like a little mouse. So once you see some of that, I call them the little mice. They're little, like, mousy-colored, pale, mousy, little cortinarius um, with pale little pinkish gills. Imagine you were drawing a little mouse in a kid's book. Those are the <laughs> anomaly. And now you've got a key. Uh, Leprosopy, something you shine, it goes bright, UV positive. Go and look in the Leprosopy key. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know if there are any more questions. There are a lot of compliments and thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And um, um, if somebody's asked about access free photos, what what are you wanting to present? Hi there. Sorry, it's Leah. it's actually just in relation to the upcoming mushroom show. I was just kind of <laughs> searching around the internet and I was like, where the heck do you find photos that don't have stamps of DreamWorks or whatever the heck on top? Where do you find your photos that aren't covered in? I take every photograph in the deck as my photo. <laughs> okay. So I take them. But on iNaturalist, uh, many people, if you filter iNat, there's some really yeah. good photographs there. And a lot of those are creative commons. Um, I don't mind people using it one or two, but because I, my, my hobby, my focus is on, I would like to be able to document them myself. So I don't just make all my photos open source because I want to be involved in describing and working on the cotton areas. It's yeah. like my obsession. Um, but I certainly don't mind if you're wanting a photograph of a trigger, so you want a photo, of a, I'm happy to send you one. So yeah, I was just trying, I was stumbling around the good old internet and I was like tr- searching free photos yes, and I'm searching free yes, commons they, photos. Yes, and I was like, yes. why is this so hard? Yeah, well, you know, I so, think you sit, ask for a set up a photography club and you, a photography group or committee and give them a list. Um, you know, I think that folks can can do it. It's actually not that hard. You just have to take the view that you're not just snapping, you're actually photographing. It's right. really mm-hmm. it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh oh! A mushroom joke. joke. There's a mushroom joke coming. You have a okay. coming. What does it? What happens if you take a Cortinarius photo without its cunt? Thanks to the corks. That is the first court joke I've ever heard. Thank you. Yes. I'm a fun guy, which is not a court joke. Very mm. funny. Good. Uh, quick word. I know the, uh, the the documentation always mentions like stipidocarpic versus like filiocarpic what is what does that mean when the when the papers mention that um i think it's the nature of its growth like does it first grow a big cap piliocarpic is the cap grows it's it's cap first so the calinarius are piliocarpic they're primarily big beautiful caps with a bulb a smaller bulb a stipe the Stipidocarpic are stipe first. They grow mainly upwards with a very large erect stipe. So it's more about stature. 
of the mushroom. And you start to see it if you look at the different genera. Some are kind of slender and tall with stipe uh, elongate with a small cap and some of these big caps with that are almost the bulb is sort of matching it almost like a clamshell and uh, i think it relates to that sort of growth and stature but you know what i would do i'd google it and then i'd look for a picture um, um because they probably have a big i spent, bet somebody spent quite some time illustrating that for us so if you want to get back to us with the official answer i'd appreciate it yeah, I haven't found any sources. It seems like only the Quartinarius people actually use that word. So, Well, it came anyway. from an early paper. I remember reading it about, about six years ago. I can probably find it because I keep a library of all oh, cool. articles, um, but it's not ex- It's not obviously Stipitoka. I'm finding out where it came from. I think it came from Garnica 2000. Oh, I think it was... Yeah, um, I'll have to find it. I remember the article drawing all the pictures of the different cotton areas. It might actually be the other thing that people use when they're interested in courts of books from Europe. So actually, I've learned most from my books. Um, you know, like there's there's court books from Europe. Um, I'm trying to find one of them now but they've all been used yeah i mean these are books that are just full of this um this is an entire loose leaf book it's all all cortinarius from europe and there's nordic cortinarius and there's swiss cortinarius and i think this might be where the growth habit is described and if so i can send that to you it's, I think it's in the prelude to this volume that they describe it. Yeah, there's like 16 volumes of Cortinarius from France. Um, oh, yeah, I think I saw those on eBay for like $1,000 or something. <laughs> yeah, I have I have like, I don't know, 12 of them, but I would wow. love to see more. Yeah. So much to learn. Any other questions? Um, always interested in helping to ID and, you know, let me know if you ever come up with any challenges or mystery subjects. Yeah, that sounds good to me. You know, one of the coolest things is I find when I got a dermosity one year, I put it onto a piece of napkin because it was pouring rain outside and my hour or two drive home later, I took it off and my napkin was stained bright red. And no matter how much I wrung that out, it actually stained it permanently. It was amazing to see wow. such. What yeah, was, it was, out of? was it cotton? I think so. Yeah. Can't remember at this point in time. It was a long time ago, but it just stained permanently, which was really neat. Yeah. yeah no, it's absolutely amazing. I'm just adding another um, link here to another t- Somebody asked for the keys. Um, you know, there's Ooh. so many of them. Right. There's yeah. so many different sections, but another one is um, reader eye, which I think is a good one because that you didn't. I didn't know that there were so many reader eye, and here's a <laughs> key from reader eye. Oh yeah, research Kate. That's a decent one. Yeah, there's a research gate often if you join, just say you're an amateur you know, researcher, um, academics who've written papers and others who've uploaded mm-hmm. them will often share them with you for free. So uh, you can access them. No, the, the, I don't think they change color with age, Alan. Um, they, I mean, they brown, uh, like all quaternarius, but uh, they're not particularly dark brown they you know they they purplish and then they kind of fade to a purplish brown but they can often still see the color until they're quite old all cotton areas actually that's the thing i didn't realize people say oh you know what did i find and they bring me these really lovely old large brown things um cotton areas change color as they age and it's so obvious to me now but i think it's worth explaining that the color when it's a button is often more vivid so it'll have a purple cap or it'll have red or it'll have purple flesh. And those things, as it grows up, they just vanish and it starts to look brown. And it's what we call browning out. 
Now, thankfully, people don't sort of fade away just at the same degree, you know, but imagine if, if your hair changed to sort of silver, everyone's hair went silver when you're about 10 years old. And then hair color is no longer distinctive. In the same way, cotton is the cap, it fades, the gills, they all go brown. And so when you're looking at photographing something, it's not going to be possible to identify if you identify four, five, ten fruit bodies that are all old, because they'll all have a common brown look. And the best we can do is kind of get to a rough section by doing some forensic identification, like was it slippery or was it big or was it little? Um, which isn't the best kind of ID. So try an ID with a mix of young and older specimens so that you can actually see the features. So a couple of years ago, Shannon, on the point of color changing, my sister had found a quaternarius that ended up changing more purple as time went on, um, more purple blue. And it, it, it was quite It's actually known for that. That's called bruising. Um, and it's not really bruising because you think of bruising as breaking the cells. I mean, I don't know the mechanism, but they do you rub or touch the flesh or you handle it, it goes more purple. The other thing that changes color um, as it goes on are the um, inf the uh, Violacea rubens, um, which is, it stains red. So that's I, it's, it's another uh, species in the same group as cyanite. So it stains burgundy. You cut it and handle it and it goes burgundy. Not it was be. the unhandling part, though. It was the cap that kept going. If Mitch was here, he'd be able to weigh in. He ended up identifying it. Ooh, no. I'm yeah, not. there was something else. Hmm. There's something odd. <laughs> it was really strange. Just with time, it started to change color. Well, the one that does that is cyanides, which goes darker, but it's more like a darker purple, then it goes red. Like, not red, but burgundy. Oh, man, I've got pictures here, but yeah, it started off gray and then it Let's went see. purple and purple. Pardon? Let's see. I want to see them. But anyway, oh, you can I message me if you can't find them right now. Well, I don't know if you can even see that. <sighs> That's the... Like it doesn't... Yeah, it looks like a Della Booty, not a um, Peppercenti, but I can't see. Then, Della Booty are like sea-colored. Like that was the grayish mm -hmm. part. Yeah, it looks like a Della Booty. Um, <sighs> there's a new species to be described in that group. Super viscid though, like very. Yeah, the Della Booty are watery and moist. Yeah. Huh. It was really interesting. It's pretty Good. strange. Well, follow your instincts because those that gen that that subsection needs work. There are many undescribed species there. Um, uh, yeah. So this is the. How do I spell that? Um, Della D E L I B U T I Deli Booty. So a species that's often described. Everyone used the name. Um, they use the name Salo, pronounced Sailor. I think pronounced like Sailor, but it's it means like I think it means the sea, and it's watery and viscid. That. Really neat. Yeah. It often has a yellowish, can have a sandy yellowish, glutenish. Um, oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, so cool. neat. Yeah, it's very cool. Well, thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it. I think everyone's kind of winding down now. Yeah, no, we, we're heading off to bed now. But, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very interested in the red uh, Demosibi. I'm still working on more of them um, because there's some undescribed species around or we still don't understand them properly. But yeah, please keep keep collecting, keep your interests up. And um, wow, Ginger, I'm getting I'm getting seasick walking along. <laughs> it's, I think I think it's time to call it. But there'll always be cotton areas out there. So um, you know, consider me a resource. I'm always happy to help. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Shannon. Thank you. Okay, good have night. a good night, everyone. <laughs> Take care. I hope everyone gets out. Mushrooms. Bye. Good night.